If you've got a really old computer that really struggles to run most operating systems, whether it be Windows or Mac OS or even other Linux distros, then Antix Linux may well be the Linux distro for your computer. Antix Linux is super light and it runs on even the oldest hardware. So in this video, I'm going to take you through the entire process of installing, configuring and then theming Antix Linux. And then at the end of the video, I'll actually show you how to create a live USB version of the operating system that you've customized. And that way you'll be able to reinstall Antix Linux with all of your customizations intact. So let's jump into the computer and get started. So this is the customization that I'll be doing today. As you can see, I can connect to my Google Drive using Rclone. I can also connect to my Megasync Cloud Drive. In my menu, if I go up to my personal folder, I have Inkscape installed and this is an app image version of Inkscape and there's a number of other things I've done as well but truly one of the most magical things about Antix Linux and this is with all of these customizations is if I open up HTOP check that out I'm only using 274 megabytes of RAM so that is truly phenomenal and that is why Antix Linux can be installed and used on even the oldest hardware out there. So let's start from the beginning and install Antix Linux. So here I am in MX Linux and this process will be very similar if you're using other Linux distros or even if you're using Mac OS or Windows then you'll still be able to follow along pretty easily. So firstly I'll open a web browser and I should just mention that I have created a new website so I hope you like it and I'm also working on a merch store so that should be up and running very very soon so if you're after some geek wear then stay tuned because I'll have some geek wear for you and it's a great way to support my work as well and show the world how much you care about being a geek. So let's jump into the Antix Linux website. So AntixLinux.com is the website and if I go to the download page, as you can see when I scroll down here, there are many, many places that you can download Antix Linux from. So these are all mirrors all around the world. So if you have slow internet connection then you can easily pick a locale that's closer to you. If you have a fast internet connection then I would actually suggest downloading from United States of America from the Los Angeles California mirror because that link will most likely have the latest updates for any of the Antix Linux ISO images. So if I click on that and as you can see here, there are many things you can download. So I'm going to just download a full version. So I can either download the 386 version if I have a 32-bit computer, then I download this 386 full. But because the computer that I'm working on right now is a 64-bit computer, I'm going to download this, which is the X64 full. Well, actually, I'm not going to download this. I'm going to download the torrent. So I'll actually go back a page and go to the torrent files and here is the 64-bit full version of Antix Linux. So I'll click that and I'll open this with my torrent client which is transmission right now. So I'll click OK and then I'll download this into my downloads folder. So I'll click open and that is now downloading. Of course, while that's downloading, I'll then jump into the Belina Etcher website. So Belina.io is the official website. If you do a search for Belina Etcher, then you'll be served up two official websites. And the other one that isn't the Belina.io website, I have heard has some malware when you download that version of Belina Etcher. I mean, it still works, but just be careful of the malware. So to find the Etcher page, just go to My Products and then click on Belina Etcher. And here is the Etcher page. So I'll go to Download Etcher. And as you can see here, there are downloads for Windows, Mac OS, and of course Linux. So the Linux version is an app image. So make sure that you know how to install and use app images. I actually have a program, if I download this, called App Image Launcher that handles my app images. So I'll open this file with the App Image Launcher, click OK. And that should download pretty quickly. 
There we go. And then I'll just simply click integrate and run. And then yes. And here is Belina Etcher. So let's check out how the download's going. And that has completed. So I'll leave the seating for a little bit until I reboot my computer. So I'll just minimize that window and also my web browser. And so what I'll do is I'll find a USB drive. So I have this USB drive here. It's a four gigabyte USB drive. So it's easily big enough to install Antix Linux onto. So I'll insert it into my machine. And just make sure if you do have any files on your USB drive to save those files because Billina Etch will actually wipe those files. So my USB drive is empty. So I'll now click flash from file and then navigate to my downloads directory. And here is my downloads. I'll actually what I should do is verify that this is an uncorrupted version of Antix Linux. So to do that, what I'll do is I'll go back to my web browser and then go to Antix Linux and I'll go to the download page. And I'll actually tile this window to the top left. Scroll down this page until I find the MD5 sums. Here we go, the MD5 sums. So what I need to do now is generate the MD5 sum for this file that I downloaded. So to do that, what I'll do is firstly Minimize all this and open a file manager window and I'll tile this to the bottom left and then open my downloads directory. And so this is the file that I downloaded. So to verify this, what I'll do is I'll open up a terminal window and then navigate to this file. So I'll change directory to my downloads folder. And then I'll run ls to list the files in that folder. And so this is the only file that I have, which is this file here. So I'll double click this to select it. Control Shift C to copy. And then at the command prompt, I'll type in MD5 sum, and that's singular, not plural. Space, Control Shift V to paste, and then press enter. And I can close this window now. And there we go, that has completed. So all I need to do now is verify that this number here is the same as this number here. So it is the same, so that's all I need to know. I can now close out of that, and knowing that I have downloaded an uncorrupted original Antix ISO image. So I'll minimize my web browser, go back to Belina Etcher, and now I can flash from file. So I'll click that, navigate to my downloaded file, and then select target, and I'll use my USB drive, click select, and then flash. Cool, so that's begun flashing the USB drive, so I'll speed up this bit of the video and then rejoin you as soon as this has completed. Cool, and that has completed. So I can now close Bolina Etcher. And what I'm going to do now is shut down my computer and boot into my UEFI settings, otherwise known as my BIOS. So I'll shut down my computer. Next, I'm going to enter my UEFI settings or my BIOS. So to do that on my computer, I'm going to press the power button and then I'll tap on the F2 key. And so here I am in my UEFI settings. So I'll go over to my boot tab and what I want to do is make sure that my USB drive boots before anything else. So I've now put it into boot option one. I can go over to save and exit and then yes to save and exit. And I've booted now into my USB drive. So I'll go up to Antix 22 and press enter. And this will boot up my computer into the USB drive. And before I begin, if I didn't have my Ethernet cable plugged in, so I'll unplug that. Then to connect to my Wi Fi, I'll go into my menu and go to Applications, Internet, 
and then I'll use the conman UI setup. So I'll click that and then go over to wireless and then I'll select my Wi-Fi network and then click connect. Now it'll ask me for my Wi-Fi password. So I'll click hide passphrase and then type in my password. Cool, I'll now click OK and I'll just install using my Wi-Fi. So I'll minimize my conman UI and then on my desktop is an install launcher. So I'll single click that and the installation has begun. So I'll press escape to skip the media check. And here we go. So if you've never used one of these installers before, to the left there are a whole lot of help files to help you with your installation. Now from here you can actually change your keyboard settings if you like and from this drop down menu there are an absolute heap of other keyboards that you can choose from but I'm going to cancel out of there because I am using the default US keyboard layout on my laptop so I'll simply go to next and in this page I can either do a regular install and this will wipe my hard drive and then install Antix Linux onto it. If I leave this as is then it will share the root and the home directories on the entire hard drive. But as you'll see from the next step I actually customize my hard drive. So I'll click customize the disk layout and click next. And as you can see, I actually have a whole bunch of other Linux distros installed onto this laptop. So to explain it better, I'll click on this button here, which launches Gparted. And Gparted is a Linux partitioning tool. It's very, very powerful and it is actually quite easy to use. Now, as you can see from the layout of my disk, I've actually allocated 44 gigabytes for each Linux distro that I have installed on my computer and the 44 gigabytes is for the root partitions. I haven't bothered to create separate home partitions for each Linux distro because I have this data partition that I use as kind of like a home partition that I can access from any Linux distro on my computer. And the cool thing about this is I can delete any of these partitions and retain all of my home files on my computer. So that means I don't have to copy over files constantly, etc, etc. Cool, so I have this unallocated partition and I'm going to install Antix Linux onto that. So if my whole hard drive was blank except for my data partition, then how I'd go about creating partitions for Antix Linux is I'd go up to create new partition and firstly I'd have to create an EFI partition and this is where the grub menu will exist and what a grub menu is is when you boot up your computer it'll allow you to select whichever operating system you want to log into. So to create that I'd go to file system and I'd select FAT32 and then I'd label this, let's see I'll just call this EFI and then change the size to 512 megabytes and then click add and so this would essentially be at the start of my computer and then I'd create a new partition and I'd create a swap partition and so swap is kind of like an extension of your RAM. So what I'd do is I'd open a calculator. So calculator is the calculator and generally the size of the swap partition is usually equal to the amount of RAM you've got. So this laptop has six gigabytes of RAM. So I'd work out six times 1024. So 1024 megabytes makes up one gigabyte. So then I'd go equal, so 6144. So I change this to 6144. And then for the file system, I'll select Linux swap and I'd label this swap, add, and then I'd create another partition. And this time I'll create a partition for my root. So with Antix Linux, you could probably get away with a root partition of around about 20 to 30 gigabytes in size. So I'd work out the size in megabytes. So I'll clear that and let's go 22 times 1024. So 22,528 megabytes makes up 22 gigabytes. So I'll change the new size to 
528. And then I'll leave the file system as ext4 and I'll label this antix22. Click add. And then all the space that I have left, I would create a data partition. So I'll leave that as ext4 and label this data. So that's what I'd do if my hard drive was empty. I'd create an EFI partition formatted to FAT32. I'd create a swap partition equal to the size of my RAM. I'd use probably about 22 gigabytes of hard drive for antics, and then I'd create a separate data partition. However, I've already created a data partition. So what I'll do is I'll delete all of these. And then I'll simply create one partition because I already have my EFI and my swap. And I'll use all 44 gigabytes for Antix Linux. So I'll call this Antix 22 and then click Add and then click on Apply All Operations, this little tick here. So Apply. And that has completed. So I'll close out of there and I can close Gparted as well. And now I'll wait for the Antix installer to register the changes that I've just made. And there we go, that has completed. So I can close my calculator. And now what I have to do is allocate the various partitions for Antix to install onto. So for the 512 megabyte ESP partition, I'll make sure that this has ESP selected. And then for the swap partition, I'll select swap from the drop down menu. And then for the antics partition, I'll select root and I'll rename that. And I won't bother about the data partition because I'll actually mount that later once I've installed Antix Linux. Of course, I've got those options selected and I'll deselect ESP by clicking on the space for the USB drive and I'm ready to install Antix. So I'll now click next and then yes. And then for the ESP, I'll use SDA1, which is the 512 EFI partition. If your computer is using MBR for its file system, then you could select MBR and then make sure that your drive is selected, but I'll go back to ESP and then click next and then I'll name my computer. So this is the name that appears on a network. So I'll type in the model of my computer. So K56CM and Antix22 as the operating system. Cool, I'll now click next and then choose my locale. So Australia and time zone Australia. Then next, and then choose my username. So stempunk, and then my password. And again, my password. And I'll also create a root administrator account. So I'll actually use the same password that I use for my login. Cool, and I'll save live desktop changes. So any changes that I make during this install will be saved. Like for example, I've actually installed Simple Screen Recorder to record the session. So by ticking this box here, that means that I won't have to reinstall Simple Screen Recorder and Simple Screen Recorder will also retain all of the settings that I've configured it with. Cool, so I'll now click next and this shouldn't take too long. So I'll go to the live log and I'll maximize this window and once the installation has completed I'll return and continue from there. Cool so that has completed so now if I click finish this will reboot my computer into Antix Linux. Cool, so here I am at the login screen, so I'll enter my username and then press enter to go to the password field. 
enter my password. And before I log in, I'm actually going to change here where it says the session type is Rocks Ice Window Manager. I'm going to change that from Rocks, which uses the Rocks File Manager, to the ZZZ Ice Window Manager. So on my keyboard, I'll press F1 and I'll just make my way to ZZZ Ice Window Manager. And now I can log in. So I'll press Enter. And as you can see, it's showing both screens again. So I'll go back to my menu and go to Applications, Preferences, A, R, and R. And then once again, turn off my laptop screen. And then make sure that my external monitor is the primary screen. And then click the tick button to apply. And now I'm back to my external monitor. So what I'm going to do now is actually save these settings so that the next time I reboot my computer, I don't have to go through this process again. It'll actually instantly load my external monitor. Now the cool thing is that if I unplug my monitor and I took my laptop elsewhere, then it would still log in using my laptop screen. So to save it, go to Layout and then Save As and then simply overwrite this default.sh file. So I'll select that, click Save and replace and that is done i can now close a r and r cool now what i'll do is i'll actually right click my desktop and go to log out and then restart my session and so this will now set everything properly onto my external monitor and so now as you can see the conky has been moved from my laptop monitor which is no longer operating onto my external monitor's desktop Cool, now I'll eject the USB drive. So down here in the panel, there is a quick launch button for unplugging removable devices. So I'll click that, select my USB drive, and then click proceed. And this is just a warning to make sure that the USB drive spins down. And as you can see, there is no light. So I'll OK to that. And I can unplug my USB drive. Cool. Now you may be wondering if you're connected to the internet. So in the Conkey, as you can see, I have WLAN zero up and down, and this is my Wi-Fi. If I were to connect my Ethernet, then it's showing that now I have my Ethernet connected as well. So it'd be nice to have an icon in my panel to show me that I'm connected either to my Wi-Fi or my network. So to get that to show, you can either go down to Menu and all of these items here that you find by clicking the Start Menu button, you can actually click anywhere on the desktop and that this is the same menu that you open from there, which is really handy. So I'll right click the desktop, go to Applications and then Internet, and then let's reopen the Conman UI setup. So I'll open that and then go over to status. And as you can see, I'm connected to both Ethernet and Wi-Fi. So I might as well turn off my Wi-Fi by clicking this button once. So I'm only using the Ethernet. And as you can see down here in the panel, there is a network indicator to show that I am connected to the Internet. So by clicking the minimize button, that leaves the icon here in the panel. However, if I were to reboot my computer or log out and log back in, that would actually disappear. So to get that to show permanently, I'll right click my desktop and open my control center and then go over to session and user desktop session. And then in the startup tab, I'll go over to line 16 and I'll delete the hash symbol. And so that's uncommented that line. So basically anything here that has a hash in front of it means that that is commented out. So it hasn't been activated. But now that I've removed the hash symbol from the Conman GUI monitor, it will now show every time I reboot my system. So if I'm on Wi-Fi, it'll show the Wi-Fi symbol or this here, which is the Ethernet connection symbol. So I'll minimize that again. And so what I need to do now is save this file. As you can see, this has turned red. So Control S to save, and that has now saved. So I can close out of there. And now that I have my internet connected, now is a great time to do an update because this is a fresh install. So I'll go over to the 
software tab in the Antics Control Center. And before I run the updater, I'll actually click on the repo manager icon to load the repo manager. And as you can see, it's defaulted to Los Angeles, California in the United States of America. Now, if I were to press this button here, then it will actually select a closer repository to my locale. And that way I can actually have faster downloads. But my internet is pretty quick, so I'm not going to worry about clicking this button. I'm happy to download directly from the Los Angeles, California repositories. So I'll just click close and then run the updater by clicking on the icon. Cool, that has loaded. So the default is the capital, so that's yes. So I don't have to type in yes, I can just press enter. And here I've been prompted about my configuration file. I can either install the package maintainers version or keep my currently installed version. So I'm gonna press Y on my keyboard. So capital Y and this will install the package maintainers version. And once again I've been prompted about my configuration file, so I'm going to install the package maintainers version, so I'll put in a capital Y and then press enter, and then do the same again, capital Y for yes, enter, And there we go, that has completed. So I'll press OK. Now I could run the auto remove, I'll actually run it. And this will remove any unused packages or anything like that that are left over after updating. But I think in my experience, doing an update on a fresh install, usually there's nothing to do. And there we go, as you can see, nothing needed to be done. So I can just simply press OK. And what I'm gonna do now, is reboot my computer to make sure everything is set in place and I'll see you once I've logged back into my computer. Cool, so I've logged back in. Now the next thing I'm going to do is launch my terminal. So Control alt t launches the terminal and what I'm going to do is theme my terminal. So what I'll do is I'll go to Preferences and then click on Configuration Manager, and then go over to Colors, and I'll select Default, and then Close. Next I'm gonna make the font a little bit bigger, just so that you can see this at home a little easier. So I'll go to Preferences, Edit Current Profile, and then for the font, I'll just make this say 14. Cool, I'll click OK, and then Close. Cool, so the last configuration to my terminal is I'm gonna get my terminal to show me password feedback. So whenever it asks me for my password and I type in my password, it's gonna show me asterisks every time I type in a letter or a number. So to do that, I'll run the command sudo visudo and then enter my password. And as you can see, there was no password feedback just then, so I'll press enter. And then I'll use my arrow key and I'll create a new line after env reset and I'll type in defaults tab and then pw feedback or password feedback. Cool, now I'll press control x to exit and then y to save the modified buffer and then enter to write it. Cool, so I'll now close out of my terminal window and I'll reopen it, control alt t and there we go, I now have my newly themed terminal. Now, Antix Linux ships with a firewall pre-installed. The firewall is called Uncomplicated Firewall, otherwise known as UFW, and I'll use UFW because it's a little bit easier to say than Uncomplicated Firewall. Now there's also a companion application that you can use in most other Linux distros called GUFW or Graphical Uncomplicated Firewall. However, at the time of this recording, GUFW doesn't actually work in Antix Linux. Now it may work in the future, but currently it doesn't. So luckily, Uncomplicated Firewall is very uncomplicated. So what I'm gonna do is open up my terminal window 
and I'll tile this window to the left, so Control Alt 1, and I'll get into keyboard shortcuts and tiling very soon in the video. So what I want to do firstly is check the status of the uncomplicated firewall. So I'll type in sudo ufw status. Press enter, and as you can see, ufw is currently inactive. So before I activate it, I'm going to configure it. So the first thing I'm going to do is allow outgoing data. So I'll run the command sudo ufw default allow outgoing. Press enter, and that is done. Next, I'm going to deny incoming. So sudo ufw default deny incoming. Cool, now UFW has configurations for a bunch of common applications. To find out what those applications are, type in sudo UFW app list. And as you can see, here are the common apps that UFW has configurations for. So I'm going to allow SSH, and this is for networking on my network. So to allow SSH through the firewall, I'll type in sudo ufw allow and then i'll use the same syntax which is in uppercase so ssh and then enter and next i want to limit ssh so what this will do is in a 30 second space if there are more than six requests or attempts to log in then it'll deny login to whichever user is trying to log in so this will stop brute force attacks and things like that so to turn on the limit run the command sudo ufw limit and then ssh in uppercase cool that is done next i'm going to make sure that the firewall will allow my ipv6 connections so to do that i'll type in sudo nano and that's to run the nano editor followed by forward slash etsy forward slash default forward slash ufw so I just wanted to make sure that IPv6 is enabled. So it is already enabled, so I can exit out of there, Control X. And now that I've done that configuration, I can now enable UFW. So I'll type in sudo UFW enable. There we go, firewall is active and enabled on system startup. So now if I check the status by typing in sudo UFW status, and I'll also add verbose, and this will give me a little bit more detail. As you can see, my firewall is now denying incoming, it's allowing outgoing, and it's allowing SSH with a limit. Now, if you wanted to learn a little bit more about how to operate your UFW or uncomplicated firewall, then there is a brilliant page on the Arch Wiki. So if you just do a search for Arch Wiki UFW, you'll find it. And it has plenty of commands that you can use to configure and use your firewall. Now, don't worry about it being an Arch Wiki page because all of those commands can be used in most Linux distros anyway. Cool, so I'll now exit out of terminal. Now, my laptop actually has two hard drives, so I want to make sure that my extra hard drive also mounts when I boot up my computer. I also have that data partition that I'm using as kind of like an extra home drive, and I want to make sure that that also auto mounts when I boot up my computer. So to auto mount partitions and hard drives, I'll right click and go to Applications, and then System, and then run the Disk Manager. And so these are the various partitions that I have on my computer. Anything that's grayed out is being currently used. So I have my boot and my Antix Linux partitions. In the enable column, anything that has a tick means that if I make any changes, that will actually save those changes. So I can easily just turn off all of these. And as you can see here from this symbol here, I've already mounted my internal hard drive because that's where I'm saving the videos that I'm recording to. But I'd like to auto mount my data partition. So I'll select it and then click edit. And then what I want to do now is change the mount point from media to MNT or mount. 
And then for the options, I can either type in uh, W for read, write enabled, and then comma with no space, and then SUID, which sets the user as the file owner, and then DEV, which interprets block special devices on the file system. And then I could type in exec, which allows files on the data partition to be executable. And then I could type in auto, which will mean that this device or partition will be automatically mounted at boot time. And then I could type in no user. And this will specify that only the root user can mount any partitions. And then I could type in async. And this means that any changes to the hard drive will be written only at the time of unmounting the partition. So I could type all of that in, or the equivalent to typing all of that in is to simply type defaults, which is much easier than what I just typed. So I'll type in defaults and click OK, and then click mount. And I can now quit out of my disk manager. And now if I open up my file manager, if I use the up arrow to go to the root of the file system, which is the forward slash, and I'll tile this to the left. Now, if I look in my mount directory, here is the data partition that I just mounted. So I can now access all the files that I have on my data partition. Next, I'm going to configure my file manager. So if I Click on this icon here. This is the ZZZFM file manager. And so it's currently configured to single click. So basically that means that to select an item, I just have to hover over it. And if I actually single click anything, it will actually open that folder. Now if I go back to home, this is a little bit more difficult if you want to select items that are not next to each other. Like for example, if I wanted to select downloads and pictures, then what I'd have to do is go to downloads, hold down control, and then hover over other items to get the non-adjacent selections. Now this is not how I normally work. So what I'm going to do is go to view preferences and I'm going to deselect the single click opens files and I'll also go over to desktop and I'll disable single click open files there as well and then click OK and now to select an item I have to actually click and I can also control click other items and if I want to open a directory then I double click it so that is now double clicking turned on Cool, so I'll go back to home. Now what I want to do is create some bookmarks. So at the moment, only my home directory is bookmarked. If I wanted to bookmark my downloads directory, then I'll select it, right click, go to new, and then bookmark. So now I have my downloads directory here as well. And to bookmark my data partition, I'll go to the root of the file system, and then go into mount, and then I'll select data, right click, new bookmark. And I'll also do the same for the project SSD, right click, new bookmark. Cool, now the ZFM file manager is also really cool because I can open tabs here by simply pressing control T on my keyboard. So now I have these tabs and I can actually copy and paste files between tabs as well, like for example, and let's see, I'll just select a file. I can uh, open a file, select it, and then drag it into this tab here. And I can just dump it anywhere I want. So for example, in my music directory, and there is the file that I just copied over. And it's still in my data partition. So I'll actually delete it from there. So that is how cool ZFM file manager is. Now in Windows I can launch Explorer or my file manager using the keyboard shortcut Windows key E. Now I'd like to create a shortcut similar in Antix to be able to launch my file manager so I don't have to go and click this launcher or this launcher or even this launcher here. So to create keyboard shortcuts for say 
the ZFM file manager, then what I need to do is firstly find the launcher for the application. So what I'll do is I'll open up a file manager window and then I'll go to the root of my system and then go to user, share, and then applications. And then I'll scroll down this list till I find the zzzfm.desktop file. So what I want to do is right click it, go to open, and then I'll open this with Genie. So Genie's just the text editor. You could use any text editor if you want. And then what I want to do is look down this list here for the line that says exec equals. So to launch the ZFM file manager, all I need to do is to remember this command here. I won't worry about anything after a space. And then to create a shortcut for this application, I'll go to my menu and go to Applications, Preferences, and then Add Key. And I'll move this up a little bit. And for my keyboard shortcut, what I'm going to use is Alt Super Key or Windows Key and E. So the first key will be Alt. Second key will be Super or Windows Key. The third key, I'll delete that and type in E. And then the command, I'll replace that with ZZZFM. Cool, now I'll press the plus button. And there we go, success, the command has been added. So I'll OK to that. And I'll close the Add Key dialog. And also the Jenny text editor. And I'll also close applications. And now if I right click my desktop, go to log out and then restart my session. And now if I press on my keyboard, Alt Super Key E, there we go, I've now launched my file manager. So that's how easy it is to create keyboard shortcuts to launch applications. Now if I close that for now and open my control center, so I'll just right click my desktop and then launch the control center and then open Edit ICE Window Manager Settings, and I'll maximize this window. And if I go over to the Keys tab, here are the keyboard shortcuts that are already configured in Antix Linux. So basically anything with a hashtag in front of it is inactive because that line has been commented out. So as you can see here, Control-Alt-T is the keyboard shortcut to launch my terminal window and that doesn't have a hashtag in front of it, so that is active. And there are plenty of suggestions also for other items. I'm actually going to turn on xkill, so I'll uncomment that and then save it. And now that that's uncommented, what I'll do is I'll restart my session. Cool, and if I ever have any applications that are frozen or I can't do anything with, it stopped working or anything like that, I can, on my keyboard, type in Control-Alt-X, and as you can see, there's a little X here, and all I have to do is click on the application, and that will force close it. So that is always a handy keyboard shortcut to have. Cool, I'll reopen my ICE Window Manager settings, and if I scroll up this page here, Right here, as you can see, there are no hash symbols there. So these are all of my tiling shortcuts. So alt Control one all the way through to alt Control 0 So I have this window here. So on my keyboard, I'll hold down Control alt And if I press 1, that tiles the window to the left half of the screen. 2 is to the right. 3 is to the top half. 4 is to the bottom half. And then 5, 6, 7, 8 is to quarter screens and then 9 is full screen, and 0 closes the window, so very, very handy. Now this is really handy if, for example, I'll open Edit ICE Window Manager Settings again. This is really handy if, for example, I wanted to transfer information from one thing to another. So, for example, if I had my web browser open, And let's see, I'll close that tab there. I could tile this whole window to the left, so Control alt one and then I could, let's say, close that. Control alt t to open my terminal, and I can Control alt 6 to tile that to the top right. And the easiest way to remember the quarter screens is Control alt 5 and 7 are for the left-hand side, and 6 and 8 are for the right-hand side. So I'll go back to the top right. And then if I had a text document, so let's open a text document. 
and I could tile this control alt 8 to the bottom right hand corner so I could easily copy and paste data from my web browser to my text editor but of course I'd have to turn on line wrapping and if there were commands that I wanted to copy and paste into my terminal then I could easily do that. So I absolutely love the fact that Antix Linux has tiling window keyboard shortcuts built in so it's very very cool. So the first cloud service I'm going to install is one called Megasync. Now if you've never used Megasync before, it's absolutely brilliant. You actually get 20 gigabytes of cloud storage that can be used. So this is really handy. It means that you can access your files from other computers or other locations as well. So to install Megasync, I'll launch my control center and then go over to software and then open the package installer. And this package installer you probably recognize from a few other Linux distros. MX Linux has something very, very similar. So the thing about all of the applications that you can find in all of these categories is that all of these applications have gone through rigorous testing to make sure that they run stable in Antix. So I'll close audio and browser and I'll scroll down to the network category and I'll open that up. And then in network, is Megasync. So I'll select that and then click install. And then press enter for the default, which is yes. And this will now install Megasync onto my system. So I'll speed up the split of the video and I'll see you very soon. And that has completed, so I'll exit the package installer and I'll minimize the control center. And if I jump into my menu, so right click, applications, internet, here is Megasync. So I'll launch Megasync. And if you don't have an account, then you can create an account from here or just go online and create an account there. But I'll quickly log in, so I'll click login. And I'll do a full sync. And Megasync automatically creates a folder in your home directory called Mega. So if I open up my home directory, here is the folder that was created. But I'm going to change that because I actually have a folder on my data partition. And this is one of my Mega folders on my data partition. So I'll go back here into the Setup Assistant, click Change, and then Navigate to my data partition and then select the Megasync folder there. So I'll click choose and then next and finish. So while that's synchronizing I'll go back to the home directory and I'll actually delete this Mega folder and I can now close out of my file manager. Now the next thing I want to do is connect my computer to one of my Google Drives. So to do that, I'll go back to the control center and I'll launch the Manage Packages installer and this launches the Synaptic Package Manager and this can also be found in your menu under Applications and Preferences and here is the Synaptic Package Manager. So I'll maximize that window and what I want to do is do a search for rclone. And so what I want to do is install both rclone, so I'll select that, and also rclone browser. So I'll, on my keyboard I'll hold down control and click that one as well. Next I'll right click, mark for installation, and then apply, and apply again. So this will firstly download the programs. And now it will install them. So I'll enable automatically close after changes have been applied. 
and there we go that has completed so as you can see now in the installed version column I now have rclone and rclone browser installed so I'll close the synaptic package manager and also the antix control center and now if I open my menu and go to applications internet here is rclone browser so I'll launch rclone browser and I'll show you how I can quickly connect to my Google Drive and actually synchronize it so I have the files on my computer. Now I've actually created a video that goes into a little bit more detail but I'll show you how I quickly do it in this video too. So firstly I'll click config and then I want to create a new remote so I'll type in n and then enter and then I'll give it the drive name so stem TV and if I maximize this window and scroll up as you can see there are plenty of cloud services that I can connect to using rclone so everything from Dropbox I can create a FTP connection I have Google Photos that I can connect to I can connect to OneDrive and OpenDrive and all sorts of things but of course what I'm doing now is connecting to my Google Drive so that's number 13 so I'll scroll down and type in 13 and I'll leave the Google application client ID blank by pressing enter and the client secret I'll leave empty press enter and so now I'm being asked what type of connection I'd like so I'd like full access to all files so I'll type in one and then enter and I'll leave the root folder ID blank so enter and then enter again and it's asking if I'd like to edit the advanced config the default is no so if I just press enter that will select n for no and I'll do the same for the default for the auto config and that has opened my web browser so what I want to do is log in to my Google account from here and I won't save that of course our clone is wanting access to my Google account so I'll just click allow and success all done so I can minimize Firefox and back in the setup it's asking if this is a team drive the default is no which is correct because this isn't a team drive so I'll just press enter for the default which is in or no and then is this okay yes and then quit of course here is my Google Drive now connected in our clone browser so if I select it and then click open this will now load the files that I have in my Google Drive. So I'll reopen my web browser and I'll tile this window to the bottom left. And I'll also open a file browser window and I'll tile this file manager window to the right. So Control Alt 2. And what I'll do is I'll log in in my web browser to Google Drive. And it should already log me in because I haven't logged out from when I was configuring our clone and there we go as you can see these are indeed the files in my Google Drive so what I want to do next is create a sync to synchronize the files onto my computer so what I'll do firstly is create a couple of tasks so I'll firstly create an upload task and then I'll select a source so this is the place on my computer where I want the files to be so I'll choose folder go to my data partition and I've already created a Google Drive folder so I'll open that and this is a Google Drive that I'm synchronizing in a different Linux distro so what I want to do is create a new folder so I'll go to this create new folder icon and then I'll name it and then open it and select choose Cool, so it's actually created an extra folder on my Google Drive. So if I left this as is, then the STEM TV folder would actually be created here and I'd be syncing anything that was in that folder. So to make sure that doesn't happen, I'll remove everything up until the end of the colon. Cool, now I'll create the sync. So I'll select sync and then delete after transferring and then I'll give this task a description. So this is the upload for my STEM TV drive. So I'll save that task and I'll do the same again for the download task. So download and then select the folder and it's already selected. So I'll click choose 
and yep there's no extra folders created after the colons so this is going to sync with my entire google drive then i'll select sync delete after transferring and then for the task description this will be upload stem tv cool i'll save that task and let's make sure that we can see what's going on so i'll go to my data partition into my google drive and this is the stem tv folder that i just created and i'll tile this to the bottom right so control alt 8 and i'll move this to the right a little bit just so we can see what's going on and at the moment the folder is empty so to download these files onto my computer then i go over to tasks and I've actually named this incorrectly. As you can see, this is a down arrow, so this should actually say download. So I'll click edit and then change that to download. Save that. And now with the download task selected, I'll click run. And if I go over to the jobs tab and open that up, this is now showing the download occurring. So now that that's completed, it says finished. So I can close this up. And, and that is how easy it is to synchronize or actually download the files from your Google Drive. Now, if I did anything on my computer and I say copied this file and then created a duplicate, now if I wanted to synchronize this with my Google Drive, I'll go back to tasks and select upload and then i'll run that and as you'll see in my google drive it will actually upload that file as well there it is there so under jobs that has finished as well now the thing to remember about our clone browser is that if you have an empty folder in your google drive like for example i'll create a new empty folder and i'll just leave this with the untitled folder name so i'll create that if I were to run the download task, as you can see, it says it's finished. And on my computer, it hasn't actually downloaded that folder. So if you do have empty folders, they won't actually be downloaded. So let's delete this from my hard drive. And then go back to tasks, upload, run. And that's running and has finished so that has removed the extra file and it has also removed the empty folder because i didn't have an untitled folder folder on my hard drive so i do this all manually just to make sure that i don't accidentally delete all my files on my google drive so for example if i deleted all of these files and then went to tasks and ran the upload task that will also delete all the files on my Google Drive. So I don't want that to happen. I have to be really conscientious about how I use this, but it's a relatively simple, free and easy way of managing your Google Drive. So I'll run the download task again, just to download all of those files. And that has completed. So I can now close our clone browser. And I'll close my file manager. And I'll also close my web browser. Now back to Megasync. One of the things to remember about Megasync is that it is a little bit resource hungry. So if you are really limited as far as your RAM is concerned, then a good way to use Megasync is to just manually launch it and then close it when you're not using it. So I'll show you what I mean here. If I open up my apps and go to my system and then open HTOP. This is showing that currently I'm using around about 787 megabytes of RAM. Now, if I were to exit out of Megasync, as you can see, it's actually reduced this by more than 200 megabytes of RAM. So that's how I use Megasync on my really, really old slow computer is that I actually just periodically run it. But if I'm not using my Megasync drive, then I don't actually turn it on. Now that said, 
One thing I should mention about Megasync is that you need to use it or log in. It's like once every, I think it's three months or six months. I can't remember the exact time period. I mean, I use mine all the time, so it's not an issue for me. But I have in the past lost a lot of data from one of my Megasync drives that I didn't log into within that time period. And it actually deleted all the files. I mean, it keeps your account, but it actually deletes all the files. So just keep that in mind. If you're going to use Megasync, then just log in every now and then just to keep it active. Right, so now it's time to beautify Antix Linux. So I'm now going to do some theming. So in my menu, I'll go to settings and then themes. And these are all the different themes that you can install. So as you can see, there's a diamond here. And that's showing that clear view blue medium is currently being used. So I'm going to change this to use a dark theme. So I'll go up to B and then select blue day medium. And there we go, I now have a dark theme. So if I open up my menu, as you can see, here's the dark theme and I also have a blue highlight. Cool, next I'm going to change the wallpaper. So I'll reopen my control center and here is choose wallpaper. Now before I launch that, I'm actually going to move an image that I've downloaded into one of my system folders and that way it'll be available to my system. So to do that, what I'll do is I'll launch my file manager and I'll Control alt one to tile this to the left. And if I go into my data partition and then in the mega drive and then in stem assets under backgrounds, here is the image that I'd like to use. And then next what I'll do is I'll go to file and then open a root window. So what I'll do is make sure that I'm in my root. So that's the forward slash and I'll tile this to the right. And then go to user, share, and then wallpapers. Here it is there. I just started typing it in and it automatically chose wallpapers or wallpaper. It's actually a singular, not a plural. And then all I need to do is copy this file here and then paste it into the wallpaper directory. Now, the reason why I had to open the root window is because if I if I open this directory just in my normal file manager, I can't actually paste any image into this directory because it is locked to the root of my system and not to me as the user. So as you can see, all of these items here that are grayed out, I can't actually do. So hence why I had to open the root window. So that said, I'll close my file manager and then back in the Antics Control Center, I'll choose Wallpaper and then select Picture. I'll select the picture that I downloaded and click open and then apply and close. And that's all I had to do. So this is a cool image. It is created by a user called Magok on DeviantArt. So a shout out to you, Magok, if you're watching, this is an awesome piece of work that you've created. And I absolutely love your work, by the way. And I'll also put a link to this image in the description. Cool, so I'll now reopen my control center. And if I open up my file manager, as you can see, my file manager still has a light theme, even though I've selected Blue Day Medium, which is a dark theme. So I actually want to apply a dark theme to my widgets as well. So what I'll do is I'll go to Customize Look and Feel. And I'll just move this over to the left a bit. And then in the Widget tab, I'm going to select a dark theme here. So the Add Waiter dark theme is actually really cool. So I'll select that and then click apply. And as you can see, it's now applied the dark theme to my other windows as well. Cool, so the next thing I'll do is go to mouse cursor. And because I'm using a dark theme, I want to change this mouse cursor to a light cursor. So I'm gonna choose breeze snow and click apply. And now I can close out of customize look and feel. And as you can see, Currently, the mouse cursor is still the same as it was before, so I need to right click my desktop, go to log out, and then restart session. And as you can see, now I have my new mouse cursor. Cool, so next thing I want to do is theme my login screen. So when I log into my computer, so to do that, I'll go to session, and here is the login manager right here, so I'll launch that. 
So the first thing I'll do is change the default user to me as the user and that way I don't have to type in my username every time I log in, it will just default straight to the password. For the theme I'll change it from antics to blue lines and then for the background I'll use the same background that I'm using for my desktop. Cool, I'll apply that and that is my login screen now configured. Cool, so next I'm going to edit my start menu icons. So currently this is the blue day medium icon for the start menu, but I actually want to change that. And what I'm going to do is actually borrow one of the start menu icons from a different theme. So what I'll do is I'll open up a file manager window. And what I'll do is I'll go to file root windows to open a root window. And then I'll click the home button to go to the root of my file system and then go to user, share, and then I'll start typing in ice wm, so ice wm, and then I'll open the ice window manager folder, go to themes, and I'm going to borrow the start menu icon from the antics magic medium theme, so I'll open that up, go to taskbar, and then copy the start.xpm file. So I'll right click that, copy it, and then go up a few folders, and then go to the Blue Day Medium theme, which is what I'm currently using, and then go to Taskbar, and I want to paste it in here. So before I do that, I'll actually preserve this file. So I'll select it, and then press F2 on the keyboard to rename it, or you could just right click the file and click Rename. And what I'll do is I'll just amend this by also putting original and then rename. So that's now saved this image if I wanted to go back to it in the future. Then I'll right click and paste the start.xpm file from the Antix Magic Medium theme. And that is all I need to do. So I'll close out of there and there and I'll restart my session. And there we go, I now have my new start menu icon. Next I'm going to download an icon theme to use system wide. So I'll open my web browser and I'll maximize the screen and then open a new tab. And what I'm going to do is do a search for the Cora icon theme. So if you've used Linux before, then you probably will have come across the Cora icon theme. It's absolutely brilliant. And the reason why I'm going to download and use it is that a few programs that I use don't actually have icons in the pre-installed icon themes in Antics. So hence why I actually use this icon theme. So Cora icon theme. And I'm going to go to the GitHub page for the Cora icons. And I'll just give a shout out to the team at Bicas. This is a brilliant icon theme, so thank you for your hard work on this. Cool, so I'll just scroll down the page here, and what I'll do is I'll tile this to the left. And what I want to do is clone this repository to my system. So I'll open my terminal, Control Alt T, and then I'll change to my downloads directory. So CD downloads. And then I'll copy this code here and then run the command in the terminal. So control shift V to paste and then press enter. And it's saying that git is currently not installed. So I'll quickly install that. So sudo apt install git hyphen y for yes. Cool, so that's completed. I'll control L to clear the screen. And then by pressing my up arrow, this will actually load my previously run commands. So up arrow, up arrow, and then enter. And this is now downloading the Cora icons. Cool, that has completed, so I can exit out of terminal. And what I want to do is move these icons to my user share icons folder. So I'll open a file manager window and I'll go to my downloads and here is the Cora icon. So I'll actually open that folder and I want to copy this folder which actually has all of the Cora icons. So I'll right click copy and then open a root window and I'll toggle this to the right, control alt 2 and then navigate to my icons folder. So 
I'll go to the root of my file system then go to user share and then I'll start typing in icons there we go and I want to paste this folder into this directory so to safely paste it in without accidentally pasting it into a folder I'll scroll to the far right and then right click paste so here's my Cora icons so I can now close out of my root window and if I go to my home directory and I'll leave this open so you can see the icons change here so now what I want to do is open my control center again and then go to customize look and feel and then go over to icon theme and then select Cora and apply and there we go I now have my new icons so at the moment these icons haven't been applied system-wide so for example in my start menu all of these icons need to be changed manually and if I go to applications all of these applications are still using the same icon set that it was before so to actually apply these icons system-wide then I'll close out of customized look and feel and I'll close my file manager and also Firefox and so what I want to do now is launch the edit ice window manager settings and I'll maximize the screen so control alt 9 and then go over to preferences and I'll just scroll down this page until I find the pathways to the icons so where is that here they are and so what I'm going to do is actually add a new line specifying the pathway to the Cora icons so let's find that pathway so I'll open my file manager and then I'll use my up arrow to go to the root of my file system and then go to user share and then icons and then Cora and then apps and scalable so these are the icons that I want to use so what I need to do is copy this and then jump back into my ice window manager settings and I'm going to create a new line and then I'll type in icon path equals open quotation mark and then control V to paste and then I'll put in a colon and go back to my file manager and I'll go up a couple of folders and then open the mime types folder and then scalable and I'll copy that pathway and back in the ice window manager settings after the colon I'll paste that and then put in a closing quotation mark cool and then in the line at line 563 I'm going to copy that whole line control C to copy and that way I can always go back to it create a new line and then paste then I'll comment out the original line and that way it is safe and I can go back to it and what I'll do is for this new icon path I'm going to delete I'm going to delete this pathway here so I'll delete everything including the colon cool and now I'll save that and I can close out of the ice window manager preferences and I'll minimize my file manager right so now if I restart my session what you'll see is that the icons won't have been applied yet so there is a really simple workaround just go to preferences menu manager and then select applications show and then I'll just scroll down this list till I find Megasync that I just installed and as you can see it's set to not set and you can do this with any application that has not set next to it so I'll double click that and then refresh and now if I jump into my apps menu and go to applications as you can see I now have my Cora icons that have been applied system wide so occasionally when you install applications it'll default back to the original papyrus antics icons so you just have to do that one step to reactivate the Cora icons if you want to use the Cora icons of course everything's looking pretty cool what I'd also like to do is edit these icons here to show the Cora icons so for example this is file manager but I'd like to change this to show one of these types of folders as well so to change these icons jump back into your control center and click on edit ice window manager settings 
and then under the menu tab you just have to change the pathway to the icons that you desire so for example I'll tile this window to the right Control alt 2 and I'll open my file manager and then go to the apps scalable directory actually what I'll do is I'll bookmark the scalable folder so I'll right click it and go to new bookmark and that way I can easily access these and so all I need to do now is do a search for terminal so scroll down to T there we go we have a terminal.svg icon so I'll select that right click it go to actions copy path and then in the ice window manager settings change the pathway so I'll just select the current pathway to the antex terminal icon and I'll select all of that control V to paste and then I'll delete the apostrophes at the end and the start and also the extra space control S to save and now if I look in my menu I now have my new Cora icon applied to my menu so I'll do the same for the file manager so what I'll do is I'll actually go up a couple of folders and then I'll go to places scalable and then here is a folder so I'll select that actions copy path and then for file manager I'll select everything including the space select that pathway control V to paste and then I'll remove the apostrophes at the start of the end and if you hold down your control key and then press your left arrow you can actually jump whole words at a time and save that and let's have a look at that now so now I have my new file manager so what I'm going to do now is speed up the video while I edit the rest of these and then rejoin you once I've completed doing that Cool, so I've finished configuring so if I jump into my menu what I've done is I've deleted some of the items from my menu because I've got keyboard shortcuts that will launch those items and I've changed all of these icons and I've actually left some of the icons the same like for example this help icon is the same and also this refresh icon and that's just given a little bit more of a personal touch to my system Cool, next I'm going to edit my Conkey. So to edit this, then I'll open up my control center. And here is the edit system monitor or the Conkey. So I'll select that. And I'll expand this window a little bit. So we can see what's going on. And I'll zoom in a little bit. So if I scroll all the way to the bottom of the page, this is where I can directly edit my Conkey. So for example, where it says Antics, as you can see here, it says Antics at line 103. I can easily add 22 and save that, and that will automatically update the Conkey to say Antics 22. I can change the time from 24 hour time to 12 hour time. So that's really easy to do. I'll just replace the capital H here with a lowercase l and then after the percentage m put a space in and put in percentage capital p so that's for am pm so i'll save that and there we go i now have 12 hour time i can remove a line so this line here that says uptime i can just go to the uptime line and at the start add a hash symbol to comment that line out so i'll save that there we go and if I scroll down to the bottom of the page if I uncomment the second to last line at line 138 and save that now I've got my battery details down here and if I wanted to change the colors so for example this color here for the time so if I look at line 102 where the time is it's using color 8 so if I scroll up here to the colors color 8 is this color here so I'll open my menu and go to applications and then in the antics category I'll run the YAD color application so I'll just move this over here and if I copy this and then paste it into YAD color and I'll just paste it in after the hash symbol 
and then press tab this is showing that that color is this light blue so that's the light blue here here and here so to change that i'm going to change that to a color that i'm actually using on the desktop so what i'll do is i'll minimize that and i'll click the eyedropper tool and i'll get a sample color from my desktop so let's see i'll choose say this light mauve in here oh no not that one it's a bit dark so we'll try so we'll try that okay i'll try another one how about that color so that color is a bit easier to see so what i'll do is i'll copy everything after the hash symbol Control c to copy and then reopen the conky editor and i'll replace this color here so i'll select that Control v to paste and save that and there we go my conky is now using one of the colors from my desktop if i wanted to change these colors in my graphs then i'll just scroll down here and so all of these colors here where it says 5599cc i'll copy that and go into yad color and paste it in here after the hash symbol and press tab and so that indeed is the graph colors so what i'll do is i'll minimize this again and i'll use my eyedropper tool and let's see i'll pick say this color here so i'll copy that go back to my conky and what i want to do is replace all of these colors with this color here so to do that i'll press ctrl h on my keyboard and that's to replace you can also find this in search replace so there's the shortcut ctrl h and because i selected this color here it's automatically pasted it into the search field and in the replace field i'm going to paste the color that i chose from my desktop and then i'll expand replace all and i'll replace everything in the document so when i press this these colors will change to that so let's do that now and if i save that there we go i've now colored my conky now if i wanted to change the fonts i can just replace this font with a different font but with all that work done actually what i'll do is i'm actually going to turn off the conky because down here in the panel in my system tray i actually have my battery details i have my ethernet connection i have my ram usage and my cpu so i don't really need this to tell me the same information that i can quickly see down here in my panel so what i'm going to do is actually turn off my conky so i'm going to close that and i'll close yad color so to toggle my conky off i could easily just go to my menu and then under desktop here is conky on and off so i can toggle that off however the next time i reboot my computer the conky will reappear so to actually get it to permanently not show on the desktop i'll go to session user desktop session and then in the desktop session.conf tab i'll scroll down here till i find the conky instructions so load conky equals true so this is currently instructing my system to load the conky when i log in so i'll change that from true to false save that and then what i'm going to do is log out of my system and then log back in so i'll log out Cool, so now that I've removed the conky from my desktop, I'm also going to remove these two launchers here. So I have a keyboard shortcut to launch file manager. So I'm going to remove that by deleting it. And this is just the launcher that I'm deleting. And then the antics frequently asked questions. If you jump in your menu and go to help, and then in the antics folder, here are the antics frequently asked questions right there. So I don't need this on my desktop either. So I'll delete that from my desktop and now i have a clean desktop and this is how i prefer to work anyway rather than having clutter on my desktop
cool. So the next thing I'm going to do is change this clock here. So at the moment, if I hover over it, it does show me the day, the date, and the month, and the year. But I'd like all that info to actually show permanently on my taskbar. And that way, I can always know what the day and the date is, etc. So what I could do is simply right-click the clock, and then select Date. And that gives me all of those details. But I want to shorten this a little bit and remove the year and also change the time from 24 hour time to 12 hour time. So to edit that, I'll open my control center and then edit ICE window manager settings and then go over to the preferences tab and I'll just scroll down here to I think it's about line 600 and something. There it is here, line 638. So I'm going to create a new line. And then I'll type in time format. And that's with capital T and F equals quotation mark percentage lowercase a. And that's for a truncated version of the day space percentage underscore D. And it's a lowercase d. And so this is the date. But if it's a single digit, then it's not going to show that leading zero. Then I'll put in percentage B, and that's lowercase, and that's for a truncated version of the month. And then space percentage lowercase L for the hour, percentage capital M for the minutes, and then space percentage capital P for AM, PM. Then I'll put in my closing quotation marks. I'll save that. And I can close out of there now. And if I restart my session, log out, restart. There we go. I now have my clock. Actually, I forgot to put in the colon. So I'll have to go back to the edit ice window manager settings again. Go to preferences. Scroll down to what was it? 638, I think it was. And then I'll place in a colon between the hour and the minute. Save that and let's restart the session again. So right click, log out, restart session. That's better. Now I have the colon in there as well. Now, before I continue, I thought I'd just mention to please be very careful if you're going to delete any of the pre-installed antics applications. Many of these applications are vital for Antics to run. Now, one of the cool things about Antics is that it doesn't actually use any applications that come from big corporations. So there's no spyware or anything like that in any of the apps that are pre-installed. With that said, let's get into managing the applications. So if I open up my control center and then go over to the software tab, I have two ways here of installing applications. So I can either use the package installer and then to install applications is really easy. You just go to the category and open that up. And the cool thing is you can also install multiple applications all at once. So it's a very quick way of getting all the applications that you want on your system installed. Now, if you are really limited with your RAM, then you'll probably find it really difficult to surf the internet these days. If you just use one of the big browsers like Firefox or Chrome, those browsers actually require a lot of RAM. Now, if you are limited with your RAM, there is a brilliant browser called Falcon, and Falcon will allow you to actually surf the internet. It even has cool extensions like ad blockers and a few more. So I'm going to install Falcon. I'll also scroll down the page here, and in the non-free category, I'll expand that. And I'm going to install the non-free video codecs. And this will allow me to play most videos that I download or anything like that. So with those two now selected, I'll go to install. And then simply press enter for the default, which is yes. And that has completed. Now, if you wanted to uninstall an application, so I'll click no here. So for example, if I open up the video category, as you can see, 
SM tube is grayed out, which indicates that this application is installed. So to uninstall it, simply select it and then click the uninstall button. So it's that easy. Cool, but I'll actually leave this installed. I'll just click close. Now, if I jump into my apps menu, I actually have a category here called games. And in my games category, I have DOSBox Emulator, which is an emulator which will enable you to play really old school games in antics. And there's also Mahjong. Now, I don't actually use either of these, so I'm going to remove them. So to remove them, I'll use the Synaptic Package Manager. So I can launch that from here under Manage Packages. And all I need to do is go to search and then first do a search for DOSBox. And in the Synaptic Package Manager, anything in the installed version column that has a version number indicates that that application is installed. So this is DOSBox, so I'll select it and mark for complete removal. And then I'll also do a search for Mahjong. And here is GNOME Mahjong, which is installed. So I'll select that and mark for complete removal. And now when I press apply, this will uninstall both of those programs. So apply again. And I'll open the details. So this should be pretty quick to uninstall. There we go, that's done. So now if I jump into my apps menu, there is no longer a games category. However, if I were to actually install a game, I'll go back to the Synaptic Package Manager and I'll do a search for, let's see, Sudoku. And I'll install this one here. So I'll click the tick box and mark for installation and then apply and apply. And this should be a very quick install. There we go. So I can close out of Synaptic Package Manager now. And now if I jump into my apps menu, here is the games category once more and I have Sudoku. Now because I installed an application, as you can see, all of my icons have reverted back to the Papyrus Antics icons. So I can easily fix that simply by going to Preferences, Menu Manager, Applications, Show, and I'll minimize the Control Center. And then I'll scroll down to, say, Sudoku that I just installed. And it's set to Not Set, so I'll select it, click OK, and then Refresh. And that has finished, so now if I check out my Apps menu, I once more have my Cora icons that have been applied to the system. So it's one step to take once you've installed an application, but it's pretty easy to do. Now, if you look down here in the panel, I have some quick launch items. And so to manage these, what I do is I go into my apps menu, and then in the antics category, I'll run the Ice Window Manager Toolbar Icon Manager. Bit of a mouthful. And so to add a launcher, all I have to do is click Add Icon. And then I'll scroll down to, say, Firefox. And even though this is doubled up, I'll simply select the first one. I think you can select either one, it doesn't matter. Add Selected Apps Icon. And that's Firefox. I'll also add Megasync because then I can easily launch it from my panel. So Megasync. And I'll also add R-Clone so I can connect to my Google Drive really easily. So R-Clone Browser. And that's all I'll add to my panel. So I'll quit out of there. Now if I wanted to remove an icon, so for example this web browser icon which launches my default browser, but I do have Firefox here anyway. And I have a file manager launcher, but I have created a shortcut to launch my file manager. And I also have my software installer, which is the package installer for Antics. I'm going to remove all three of these items. So 
I'll just go to the remove icon button and then select say the software installer and I'll remove that and then I'll click remove icon again select the web browser remove that and then also the file manager so that's tidied things up a little bit now if I wanted to use the Quora icons on these items here then I'd go to advanced and then yes and then I just have to change the pathways to the icons. So I'll do that really quickly. I'll control alt T to tile that to the right and then open my file manager alt super key E and then in scalable I have two tabs open for that. I'll firstly look for Firefox there we go and I'll select Firefox and right click it go to actions copy path and replace the pathway to the Papyrus Antics icon and of course remember to remove the apostrophes at the end and the start and then I'll do the same for Megasync I'll search for Mega there we go right click actions copy path and replace that image pathway remove the apostrophes and then our clone browser now this is the browser icon that i'll use and as you can see this is a shortcut so i'll right click that and then go to the real path and here is our clone browser the actual icon so i'll right click that actions copy path and then our clone browser i'll replace that pathway with the Cora icon and i'll remove the apostrophes and save that cool so i'll now close out of there and i'll close my file manager and so now i'll right click and log out restart session so here are my new icons the last thing i'm going to do is actually i'll create an icon for the unplug removable device so i'll go back to advanced and yes and i'll tile this to the right reopen my file manager and then do a search for usb i'll just scroll and i'll use a mount icon so i'll right click that actions copy path and then i'll replace this image pathway paste that and remove the apostrophes and save that so i'll close out of there and there and i'll restart my session and there we go i've now changed all the icons that i want to next i want to move my firefox icon to the far right so i'll click on move icon and then select Firefox and click move and then move right and move right again. Cool, I can now quit and that is my toolbar icon manager. Now if you have applications that you use all the time, there is a really cool menu that you can add items to in your apps menu. So in the personal menu you can actually add items here now as you can see i've already added simple screen recorder and there is an informative video that was put together by running with the dolphin who is one of the lead developers for antics and mx linux 2 and you could watch this video but i'll show you quickly how to add items to the personal menu so go to applications and then in the antics category here is the personal menu editor so i'll run that and what I'll do is I'll actually add this personal menu manager to my personal menu. So I'll click on the app.desktop file button. And then in the antics folder, I'll open that and scroll down to the fast personal menu editor. So I'll double click it and then add selected item. And now in my personal menu, here is the fast personal menu editor. And so now with this in the folder, I can easily launch the fast personal menu editor from there and let's add another item and so this time i'll add let's see libra office writer where is that 
there it is I'll select it or double click it and then add selected app and now I have two items in here and as you can see it hasn't actually brought over the icons so I'm going to organize these I'm going to move this to the top and rename it and I'll also remove this from the menu and also change the icon for LibreOffice Writer so I'll run the fast personal menu editor and then this time I'll organize entries and click OK and then I'll tile this to the right and then open my file manager and then in scalable I'll firstly find the LibreOffice Writer icon so LibreOffice so LibreOffice and let's see LibreOffice Writer so I'll select that and that is the shortcut so I'll right click that and then go to the real path and now I'll right click that and copy the path and paste it in here oh careful of course remove the apostrophes and I'll also rename it so I'll give it a capital L and a capital W I'll also edit the name of the fast personal menu editor and I'll just call this the personal menu editor and so now I'll remove the personal menu help video and then I'll move the personal menu editor I'll control X to cut that and I'll paste that at the top of the list and I'll also move simple screen recorder to the bottom of the list and save that and now if I jump into my apps menu as you can see I've now reorganized these items renamed them and also created an icon for one of the items that didn't have an icon I'll also rename Simple Screen Recorder while I'm here with capitals Simple Screen Recorder. Save that. And that is the Personal Menu Editor. Now to specify the default apps like for example if you wanted to have a specific browser that opened if you click links and documents etc then you simply launch your control center and then in desktop here is the preferred applications function so I'll open that and from here for example if I wanted to make Falcon my default web browser then I can easily just change it in here and so I can change any of these items but I'm going to go back to using Firefox as my default web browser so I'll just apply that and I'll close the control center now if there's an application that you'd like to use which you can't find in either the package installer or the synaptic package manager or if there's an application that you'd like to use the latest version of then if there is an app image version of that application then you can actually install and use that now one of the programs that I use a lot is a program called Inkscape and I like to use the latest version of Inkscape if I were to use the stable version that you can find in the package installer then that is a little bit older and it doesn't have a few of the functions that I like to use now because Antix is not a systemd system I can't actually use the snap pack and in my experience in Antix I've had a few issues trying to run flat packs of certain applications that I use so I'm going to go to the Inkscape website and I believe there you can download the app image of the latest version of Inkscape so I'll do a search for Inkscape and here it is inkscape.org and as you can see here the version of Inkscape that you can download is 1.2.2 however if I go into my control center and run the synaptic package manager and do a search for Inkscape the version that you can install from the synaptic package manager is 1.0.2 
1.2.4. So I'd rather use 1.2.2, which is the latest version of Inkscape. So I'll go to the download button and then click on the Linux link. And here is the executable app image. Now the cool thing about app images is that for a lot of programs to run on a system, they require specific dependencies. Now if you don't actually have those dependencies on your computer, then a lot of these newer programs won't run. However, with app images, all of the dependencies are actually bundled in with the program itself, which is absolutely brilliant. So I'll download the app image. And that's downloading now. And the download has completed, so I'll close out of Firefox now. And then open a file manager window and go to my downloads directory and here is the Inkscape app image. So to get this to run on my system and also create a launcher for it, what I'll do is I'll open a new tab, control T, and then in my home directory, I'm going to get this to show my hidden files. So control H on my keyboard, and now I want to create a new folder. So control F on the keyboard to create a new folder, and I'll call this dot apps. And so this is a hidden folder. So I'll click create and then I'll go into the folder and then go and click and drag the app image into the apps directory. So there it is there, I've now moved it. Next what I wanna do is make sure that this is executable. So I'll right click the app image and go to properties, permissions, and then for the owner, which is me, I'll enable execute and okay that. And so this is now executable. So the next step is I want to create a launcher for this that I can place in my personal directory. So to do that, I'll go to file root window and then I'll go to the root of my file system and then go to user share applications. And so I want to create a new file. So control shift F to create a new file. And I'll name this inkscape.desktop. So I'll create that. And now I'll edit this file. So if I right click it and then open it with Genie. And now I'll fill in some text. So firstly in square brackets I'll type in desktop entry. Closing square brackets create a new line and then type equals application new line and then type in exec so executable equals and so what I need to do is copy and paste the pathway this here to this app image so I'll just right click it go to actions and then copy path and then in my text editor I'll paste that in, but of course I'll remove the apostrophes. And also I don't want a space between the equal sign and the start of the pathway. Cool, I'll create a new line. And next I'll select the icon. So icon equals, and then let's find an icon. So in my scalable folder, I'll do a search for Inkscape. There we go, I'll select inkscape.svg, right click, actions, copy path, and then I'll paste that after the equal sign, and remove the apostrophes and the space. Then I'll go to the end of the line and create a new line, and now I'll type in name equals inkscape, and then a new line, comment, equals and then I'll just type in vector forward slash image editor and then in brackets app image just so I know that it is an app image then I'll create a new line and I'll type in categories so this is whereabouts I'd like this to exist so categories equals and I'll type in graphics and then semicolon 
cooler now I'll save that and I can close my genie editor now and I'll also close my file manager and so what I want to do next is add Inkscape to my personal menu so I'll launch the personal menu editor and what I'll do is I'll select add desktop file and then scroll down to Inkscape there it is there I'll select it and click open and add selected app and I can close this root window as well and let's see if Inkscape has come in yes it has so now I want to move this and also give this an icon so I'll open the personal menu editor again and then click organize entries and OK and let's find that Inkscape icon again so in my file manager I'll do another search for Inkscape there it is so I'll right click that actions copy path and then I'll paste the pathway over the current image pathway and remove the apostrophes and I'll also move this up one line so control X to cut and then I'll create a new line above simple screen recorder and I'll paste it in there and I'll also get rid of that space so I'll save that and close out of my personal menu editor and now in my personal menu I have a launcher for Inkscape so I'll launch it now and see if it works yes it does so there we go I have Inkscape and it is the latest version of Inkscape as well now to delete an app image then what I'd have to do if I close this again is firstly open a root window and then I have to delete the inkscape.desktop launcher from here so I delete that and then I'd also in my home directory have to delete this app image and also in the config folder I'd also have to delete this inkscape or any mention of inkscape in my config folder so it's a little bit finicky but definitely worth the effort to be able to use the latest versions of software now if you are using a data partition as I am then I actually have if I open up my data partition I actually run my app images from here so I actually have all these app images that I use and that way I don't have to re-download all of the app images for every single Linux distro that I use on my system and if I were to reinstall Antix or any of the Linux distros then I still have all of these app images still on my system that I don't have to re-download so to actually use this app image rather than the one in the .apps folder then what I would have to do is change the pathway to the app image so I'll go to root window and I'll tile this to the right this time and then in my data partition let's find the app image so I'll right click that and go to actions copy path and then if I go back to the user share applications folder and find Inkscape again and I'll select it right click and open it with Genie and then I'd simply have to change the pathway to the executable so I'll select that and then control V to paste and remove the apostrophes and space control S to save and I can close that and my root window and if I go to home and then go into dot apps and delete this app image And that's removed Inkscape from my personal menu editor so I'll re-edit and I'll reorganize as well copy the pathway to the icon and of course paste it in here and I'll move simple screen recorder down one 
and save that. And there we go. I now have Inkscape. And this is launching the app image from my data partition this time. And there we go, that is working. So that is how to add an app image to Antix Linux. Now Antix uses ELSA Audio to manage the audio on the system. If I go down to the taskbar and right click the volume icon and then open Mixer, as you can see here, this is the ELSA Mixer. So to control audio using the ELSA Mixer, I'll use my left arrow and at the bottom it will move over to, to various things. So for example, if I wanted to have some mic volume, I'll use the up arrow to add some volume and if I needed to boost my computer's microphone then I can also boost it from there. Now because we're using a dark theme I can easily change the icon color so if I just right click it and then go to preferences and then for the icon theme I'll change this from black gnome to default and then close that and as you can see I've now got a light icon on my dark panel. Now Elsa Mixer is perfectly fine, it works great. However, I actually have a preference to use Pulse Audio because for my needs I like to have just a little bit more control of my audio. Plus I also do some audio recording, so I need to have a jack server installed which requires Pulse Audio. So what I'm going to do now is install Pulse Audio. So Pulse Audio works in tandem with Elsa Audio, so there's no need to remove Elsa Audio from the system. So I'll escape to exit out of there and what I'll do is open my control center and then go over to software and then open the package installer and then in the audio category I'll install Pulse Audio. And then I'll click enter for the default which is yes. And that has completed, so I'll exit the package installer. Next I want to download a program that will allow me to have an icon in the taskbar related to Pulse Audio. So to do that I'll open the Synaptic Package Manager and then do a search for Pulse Audio. And that's all one word. And what I'll do now is scroll down this list until I find the PA sys tray or Pulse Audio System tray. So I'll select that, mark for installation, and then mark, and then apply. Apply again, and this should be very quick to install. And that's completed already. So I can close out of the Synaptic Package Manager. Of course next I want to make sure that when I boot my system that Pulse Audio launches first. So what I'll do is go to Session and then User Desktop Session. And then what I'll do is I'll comment out line 22 for the volume icon. So that's this icon here. So I'll add a hash symbol. And then for line 19 I'll remove the hash symbol to load Pulse Audio. And then I'll also create a new line and I'll type in PA sys tray and so that's for the system tray icon followed by a space and then an and symbol. Now I'll save that and I can close out of there now and I can also close the Antics Control Center and so what I'll do is I'll restart my session so log out restart session and there we go, I now have this icon here which if I right click it shows that this is now the controller for Pulse Audio. And so now I'll reboot my system to make sure that Pulse Audio is fully integrated into my system. So I'll reboot my system and I'm back from the reboot. So now if I open Pulse Audio from the volume icon and I'll open volume control. As you can see I'm recording through Simple Screen Recorder. 
my output devices are my built-in analog audio and my input devices I'm using my microphone but if I were to plug in an external sound card so I'll plug that in now and then and as you can see the external sound card now shows up in pulse audio so I can manage my audio a lot more effectively. Cool, I'll close out of Pulse Audio and I'll also remove my external sound card. So now that I've got my system configured, what I'm going to do now is to run a clean. Now Antix Linux used to have BleachBit integrated into the system, but it no longer has BleachBit. So I'm actually going to download and install BleachBit. Now if any of the wonderful Antix developers are watching this video, firstly, thank you for your hard work. Hats off to you. This is an incredible Linux distro. It is so slim and fast on my computer. So thanks for all the work you've put into this and everyone else who's involved as well. And I do have one request if this is at all possible and that is to actually integrate a rubbish bin into Antix Linux. On occasion I've accidentally deleted files that I've tried to get out of a rubbish bin and I'm not too sure how to go about finding those files. I'm sure there's a script that I could run that will show me where the rubbish bin is. So if it is at all possible to have a rubbish bin built into Antix Linux, that would be amazing. But if not, it's still amazing anyway. So I'm going to install BleachBit. So I'll right click and open the control center. And then in the software category, I'll launch Synaptic Package Manager. And I'll do a search for BleachBit. And here is BleachBit. So I'll select it and mark for installation, apply, apply, and this should be pretty quick. And that has completed. So I can close out of the Synaptic Package Manager and I'll close the Antix Control Center and then run BleachBit. So it'll be in my applications under system. There it is there. So BleachBit, I'm not going to run it as root, I'll just run BleachBit. And I'll leave the preferences as is. I'll go to the drives and I'll also add my data partition. And also my project SSD drive. And then close out of that and now I'm ready to use BleachBit. So all I have to do now is select whichever I need to select from here. So I'll actually make this full screen. And then in the deep scan, I'll delete my temporary files. And it is warning me that this option could be slow because it is doing a deep scan. I'll also delete the thumbs. And then in Firefox, I'll delete the cache. And in the system, I'll select broken desktop files, even though there probably aren't any at the moment. I'll delete the cache. I'll also empty the rubbish bin and delete temporary files and also the thumbnail cache. Cool. Now, I should also mention that BleachBit is extremely powerful and you can actually accidentally delete some of your really vital system files. So just be very careful using BleachBit. If you select what I've just selected now, then you should be perfectly fine and safe. Cool. So now I'll click clean and then delete. And there we go. I have recovered 73.8 megabytes of disk space and I've deleted 1,125 files. So I'll close out of BleachBit now, and my system is now running extremely clean. Right, so I've now completed my configuration, and I've also cleaned the system. So now what I'm gonna do is actually save a snapshot of the system as is, and I'm going to put it onto my USB drive, and in doing that, I'll be able to install Antix Linux exactly as it is now using the USB drive. So to do that, what I'll firstly do is jump into my 
menu and go to applications, antics, and then select ISO snapshot. And so firstly, I'll select a snapshot location. So I'll click that and then go to computer mount data. And I've already got an antics 22 snapshot folder. So I'll select that and then click choose. Next, I'll give the snapshot a name. So I'll delete all of that and then choose a name. So Antix 22 Jan 2023. Cool. So then I'll click next. Now, if I wanted to exclude any folders, then I could easily just select them from here. So if I made a snapshot now, this would exclude the downloads folder, but I'm going to leave that. And for the type of snapshot, I'm going to leave this with preserving accounts. And that way this will maintain all of my logins and username, etc. And then click next and then OK. And this is now creating the snapshot. So I'll speed up this video and rejoin you as soon as this has completed. And that has completed. So I can OK out of there and close the ISO snapshot maker. And next what I'm going to do is burn this ISO image to this USB drive. So I'll insert the USB drive to my computer. And firstly what I'll do is I'll close that and then open my menu and go to applications, antics, and then format USB. And I'll just leave everything as default. Click next and yes. And this will clear the USB drive. And there we go, the format was successful. So I'll OK to that and close the USB formatter. And then go back to Menu, Applications, Antics. And this time I'm going to select Live USB Maker. So I'll select that. And it's picked up my USB drive. I'll go to Select ISO and then Navigate to my snapshot. So that's in mount data antics 22 snapshot snapshot and here is the snapshot. So I'll select that and click open. And what I'll do is because this is antics Linux, I'll actually select full featured mode. And this way when I open up antics Linux from the USB drive, if I make any changes, it'll actually write the changes to the USB drive. So that's very cool. I'll leave everything as is and click next. And I'll let that burn the ISO image to the USB drive. So I'll see you very soon. And success that has completed. So I'll OK that and close the live USB maker. And here is my USB drive with the files on it. So now what I'm going to do is reboot my computer into my UEFI settings or my BIOS. And I'll change the boot order to boot from the USB drive. And let's see now what the live version of Antics looks like running from the USB drive. So I'll go to logout and then reboot. So I've now logged back into Antics running off the USB drive. And if I jump into my apps menu, what I first notice is that some of the items that I removed from the menu during my customization have actually returned. And all of these icons have now defaulted back to the Papyrus Antics icons. So that's not a biggie. I could easily just change those or even just leave them as is. And the other cool thing is that if I go down here to the Antics installer launcher, I can actually install this live version of Antics back onto my machine. I can even take this USB drive, plug it into other computers and install Antics with all of these customizations. So I'll exit out of the installer. And if I jump back into my menu and then open my personal menu, as you can see, the app image that I installed is not showing. However, that's because it's running from the data partition, which will need to be mounted. So I'll go to applications, system, disk manager, and then select my data partition. 
and I'll quickly mount this so I'll change this back to mount as the mount point and then change the options to defaults and OK that and then I'll mount that partition quit out of the disk manager and now if I jump back into my personal directory as you can see Inkscape which is the app image has now returned to my personal files. So that is how awesome Antics Linux is. Well I hope this video helps you on your Linux journey. If you have any questions please pop them in the description. I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. And I have more videos in the pipeline so if you'd like to subscribe to the channel I'll be able to let you know when I upload those new videos. So thanks again for watching and until next time Take care and I'll see you soon.